So um, I'd like to sketch out again the proof of L'Hopital's rule that we finished up with last time, because I think I you know, didn't give um, clear enough explanation of, of how it follows from the generalized mean value there. Right? So um, L'Hopital's rule. Uh, <coughs> okay, so um, let's think about the generalized mean value theorem. Right? So you have some uh, you have some interval a b. Okay, and um, the generalized mean value theorem. Well, what does it say? It says that it says that. Uh, that there exists, there's going to be some point, there's going to be some point between A and B where uh, F of B minus F of A over G of B minus G of A uh, equals F prime C over G prime C. Right? That was, that's basically what the generalized mean value theorem says. Now we, we put some assumptions in on L'Hopital's rule so that we can divide by G prime, right? We wanted, we said that G prime was never zero, um, so I'm not gonna rewrite it, but we said that G prime was never zero inside, inside this interval, and that's why we can divide by G prime, okay? And, <coughs> right, um, okay. Uh, okay, so, okay, so maybe, you're looking at the looking at the generalized mean value theorem. You're starting to see L'Hopital's rule already, right? Right. You see that you've got some sort of you know values of f over values of g. You've got some ratio. You've got some ratio of the um, of the derivatives. You've got some ratio of the of the of the functions, right? But you know uh, L'Hopital's rule, remember, has this thing that. Um, uh, at least the version that we're doing, the limit of f of x as x approaches a um, uh, equals zero, and the limit of g of x as x approaches a equals equals zero. Right. So that's what's going to get rid of this. That's what's going to get rid of this this thing for us. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> So um, uh, what we do, uh, what we do is we say, well, look, um, we say, well, look, you know, take some point, um, take some second point in here. Uh, okay, sorry, let me do this one. Take two points inside here, x and y. So we've got our interval. We take our two points inside here, x and y, right? <coughs> then, uh, uh, by the generalized mean value theorem, says that there exists a c between x and y, where f of y minus f of x over g of y times g of x um, equals uh, f prime c over g prime c. Okay, so I'm going to give the, last time I gave sort of the, you know, the rigorous proof, now I'm going to give the hand-waving idea, okay? Okay, so you have, you know, this is what the gene generalized mean value theorem says, and so what do you do? You say, well, let the, take the limit of this as x goes to, x goes to a from the right-hand side, right? So take the limit as <coughs> x goes to a from the right-hand side, right? Well, these two terms are gonna vanish, right? F of x and g of x are gonna vanish, right? And so you basically get, um, so you get, and this is not exactly true, um, F of y over g of y um, equals F prime c over, over g prime c. Okay, right? And then what do you do, right? And this, this c is somewhere between, uh, between a and y. Okay, this isn't, this isn't exactly right, but you know, <coughs> this is the idea, this is the idea, right? And then what do you do, you let, you let y go to a, and now take the limit as, as y goes to a from the right-hand side, right? And the c is some, trapped somewhere in between, 
And so as, the, as, as y goes to a, c also goes to a, right? So you take the limit, then take the limit as, as y goes to a from the right-hand side, right, of both sides, right? And then, so you get the limit of the, of the you get the limit of the ratio of the, of the function, and you get the limit of the ratio of the, of the derivatives, right? Because as y goes to a from the right-hand side, c goes to a from the right-hand side also. Okay. So, you know, this is, this is kind of hand-wavy, um, uh, but this is, this is the idea. Okay, yeah, Myra. What both sides are you referring to here? Both sides of this, right? So you take the limit as y goes to both. Because this c actually depends on y. The c depends on y. So as as y is moving as y is moving inwards, that c is trapped between between a and y, basically, and so it gets it gets, and so you get that the limit of the quotients of the function is the limit of the quotients of the derivatives. Okay. So that's it. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I don't think I want to say again the the proof. Um, so, but this is this is the idea of the proof. Okay, so like I said last time, uh, the end of this section is sort of a, a bunch of um, uh, consequences of the theorems that we've just gotten, like Fermat's theorem, um, uh, Fermat's theorem, the generalized mean value theorem, mean value theorem. So um, uh, let's give the proof of, of Taylor's theorem, um, which is a consequence of the mean value theorem. So here it is. Um, so let's start off with the definition. Uh, you have some function on A, B. And you're given that um, uh, the n minus 1th derivative, um, right, so this is the n minus 1th derivative, is continuous on A, B and differentiable on the interior. Okay. And say so here is A, here is B. And you fix some alpha in, inside that, that uh, interval. <coughs> so um, fix alpha inside of the closed interval AB. Okay. And we define <coughs> the uh, n minus 1 uh, Taylor order, <coughs> n minus 1 order Taylor polynomial of f centered at alpha uh, as p of t is defined as, you know, this um, summation as k goes from 0 to n minus 1. Um, the kth derivative evaluated at alpha over k factorial times t minus alpha to the k. <coughs> okay, so this is this is something you've seen, uh, you've all seen before back in calculus. Okay, we're just going to give the proof of it. May, you, may, you may have seen the proof back in calculus uh, that of the theorem that we haven't stated. <laughs> so here's the theorem. Um, so under the above conditions, under the <coughs> above conditions, um, given any beta in a b um, f of beta equals the Taylor polynomial plus the nth derivative of f evaluated at some point x divided by n factorial times beta minus alpha to the n um, for some x between alpha and beta. Okay. 
so right, this guy you've seen before, I'm sure. Right, this is the Taylor, Taylor, Taylor polynomial n of the n minus 1 theorem. Right? <coughs> it's just this polynomial that you get when you're trying to approximate, you're trying to approximate your function with polynomials. Okay? And this is saying that your function basically is the Taylor polynomial. Right? The difference between your function and the polynomial is actually controlled by the nth derivative of your function. Okay, right. That um, that you have your function, you have your, your you have your polynomial. You choose some point. You choose some some point data, and the error, right? So you think you want to think of this thing as the error, right? It's the difference between f and p, right? The error. The error at 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 point B. Yes, Lara. How did you get x there? Yeah, yeah. So, so what this theorem is saying is that if you, so here's your center, right? Here's what we're calling the center. Right? You've got your polynomial. It's it's centered at a, at alpha. Okay. And we're saying if you take any other point, then the difference between your function and the polynomial <coughs> is controlled. Is you can find it by evaluating. Um, evaluating this expression at some point x between alpha and beta. Okay, and this point x should be kind of mysterious, um, but you want to think that well, it's mysterious in exactly the same way that the mean value is theorem is mysterious. Right? The mean value theorem says well, there's this mystical point c in the middle of a and b where the slope equals the average slope. Right? Okay, so that's that's exactly what's going to go on here. Okay, we're going to use the mean value theorem. It's going to give us it's going to give us this point. Okay. Okay. So the error, uh, the error is found. Some the error can be found by evaluating this thing, the nth derivative, right, times b minus beta minus alpha to the n over n factorial uh, at that point. Okay. Okay. So let me do the proof. You know, as you might suspect from looking at it, or because I told you. Uh, the mean value theorem is, is involved. Okay. So you say, okay. Um, okay, so what we're going to do first <coughs> is we're going to rephrase our problem. Uh, rephrase the problem. So, uh, let m denote um, f of beta minus p of beta over beta minus alpha to the n. Okay. So this is just some constant, right? This is some constant. Right? But what we want to show, we want to show, so here's our first rephrasal, we want to show that there exists a, an x between a and b, alpha and beta, sorry. Uh, where uh, the nth derivative at x over n factorial equals n. Okay, what exactly do you mean by between? Between? So uh, alpha and beta are like this. Beta is not the same as alpha. So x lies, x lies between alpha and beta. Not including alpha and beta. Oh. Yeah. So between, yeah. So um, I would write, I would write this, except I don't know which is bigger. Right, beta might be on the left hand side. So if if you want, you know. Anyway, between. Okay. Okay. So everybody, I hope you see we haven't done anything, right? We want we want um, to find an x to say that this thing equals f to the n. Uh, I'm sorry, the nth derivative at x over n factorial, right? We've just taken, we've just taken this thing, right? And then we've, you know, subtracted, we've divided. We said that we want that constant to be, to be at this point here, right? Everybody all right? Okay. okay. So, uh, in other words, we want, uh, we want x such that, again, we're not going to do anything. Fn x uh, minus n factorial m is equal to 0. OK. And 
And so now we, we're going to choose a problem whose solution will give us this, will give us this. Okay. So let g of t be this function. f of t minus p, the difference, minus m times t minus alpha to the n. Okay. By the way, to choose that, it's so that if I look at the nth derivative of this guy, well, I'm going to get the nth derivative of f minus 0, right, minus n factorial times m. Right. Right. So I choose this. I choose. I've chosen this function, whose nth derivative, if it has a zero, gives me gives me what I want. Right. I want to show. I want to find a place where the nth derivative of g is zero. Right. right. So it suffices. To, uh, to show that um, g n x equals 0 for some x between alpha and beta. So let's prove let's prove that. So first off, um, uh, observe or recall that um, if you take the <coughs> kth derivative, um, if you take the kth derivative of of p of, of f and the kth derivative of p. You get the same thing uh, at alpha for k being 0 to n minus 1. Right. So remember, remember your Taylor, Taylor polynomials. Right. Um, the the first k the the first derivative the derivatives are going to be the same at that at that point. Right, that's that's the point of the Taylor polynomials. Okay, so this um, this is your old knowledge of Taylor polynomials, or you just calculate it. Okay, so what does that tell you? Um, so uh, if we look at g alpha, right? If we look at g alpha, <coughs> what are we going to get? We're going to get um, g alpha is f of alpha minus p of alpha minus 0, right? So g of alpha is going to be 0. If we take the first derivative and evaluate that at alpha, g prime alpha is going to be p, p prime alpha minus, I'm sorry, f prime alpha minus t, p prime alpha. Well, that's 0. And this evaluated at 0 is, this guy's derivative evaluated at 0 is still going to be 0, right? And you keep on going like that. So g alpha is 0, right? g alpha is 0, so is g prime alpha. So it is all the way up to the k minus, I'm sorry, the n minus 1 derivative. All these guys are 0. Okay. Right, so here was our a, our b, our alpha was somewhere in here, our b was here. Right? And we know that the g's, the, that this function g uh, at alpha <coughs> is 0. Uh, for derivatives up to the n minus 1 point. Okay. okay. So, um, okay. Now, so now let's look at g of b. G of beta is f of beta minus p of beta 
minus um, m, remember what m is, f of beta minus p of beta uh, over beta minus alpha <coughs> to the n times beta minus alpha to the n, right, which is zero. Right, so just evaluate, evaluate g of beta, and you see that it's equal to zero by construction. Right, we made it. Right, what was m? m was f of beta minus p of beta over b minus uh, beta minus alpha to the n. Right, Lyra. Quick question: yes. When you're um, setting up g of t, um, yep. you take the derivative, right? How do you get n factorial <coughs> m as the derivative of the last term above? Well, right. Every time you every time you differentiate this, right, you're going to get an n. You're going to pull down an n, and it's going to have an n minus one. You differentiate the second time, you're going to pull down an n minus one, right? And what about the so the constant t minus alpha? Is that does that just disappear? At the end, you're going to get this thing to the zero. Okay. Right. You're going to get that thing to the zero, and so that becomes one. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, That that comes from so that comes from uh, from the observation. Okay, so that the that the derivatives of the function and the and the Taylor polynomial are identical up to the n minus one uh, degree um, at at alpha, right? That's so. Then you come over to here. Maybe you can't see it because people's heads are in the way. But over here. <laughs> Thank you, Max. Um, um, so then you come over here, okay, and then you just take derivatives of this and plug in alpha, okay. When you take derivatives of this and plug in alpha, what happens? Well, you've got you plug in alpha for t. When you take derivatives, plug in alpha, this thing vanishes, right? You get zero here, right? When you take derivatives and plug in alpha, you get the derivatives of these guys at alpha, but these are equal, right? We just said that those guys are equal, so so these, this this difference vanishes. This vanishes on its own. Right, and so you can see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Eric. How Eric. did you get a get an equation in the parentheses in the so that? Yes. This one. So you just differentiate, right? Right. You. Right, yeah, so this, you know, the degree of this is n minus 1, so it vanishes, oh, okay. right? So you get this vanishes, and then this thing turns into that by what we just said to Lyra, and this thing turns into that. Okay, everybody all right? Okay, so, okay, so let's, let's see what happens. So n now it all comes together. Um, uh, g, of, g of alpha is 0. So if we're looking at g, alpha is 0, g of beta is 0, right? g of alpha is 0, g of beta is 0. And so by the mean value theorem, by the mean value theorem, there exists a, a point x1 where a point x1 between uh, alpha and beta, where uh, g prime of x1 is equal to 0. Okay, so you know that there's some point in here, x1, where g prime is equal to 0, right? So here's alpha, here is beta, and here is x1. If we're looking at g prime, we know that at, at x1 we're 0. We also know that at alpha we're 0, right? And we keep on going. So uh, right, we have that g prime is 0 here and here. We apply the beam value theorem to it. We get an x2 where the derivative is 0, right? So we get a point x2 where g double prime is 0, right? right? And so on and so forth, right? We keep on going to the end. We end up with a point where, uh, we end up with a point where, um, uh, you know, a point x sub n minus 1, right? Where the n minus 1th derivative is 0, 
And this guy's the so so we're gonna point alpha and x n minus one where the n minus one derivative is zero. Right? But using the mean value theorem, that tells you that there's a point where the nth derivative is zero. That's what we wanted. Right? There's a point where the nth derivative is zero. The end. Okay. okay. So that's the proof of, of Taylor's theorem there using the mean value theorem. Any questions? Yeah, Susan. Could you write down the last thing you said? Don't write down the last thing I said, sure. <laughs> right, so I'll say, um, uh, right, so dot, dot, dot. <laughs> there exists um, an x n minus 1 uh, where g n minus 1 derivative, this thing equals 0. Um, so, by mean value theorem, there exists an, a, a point x uh, where um, where g super n x equals zero as desired. Right? We're looking for this point where the nth derivative equals zero, and we found it. Right? All those x of n's are between alpha and beta. Right, all those x of n's are between alpha and beta. Right, right. This guy is between x n minus two and alpha. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? OK, let's go on. So um, sorry, I'll sit from here. OK, so I think at this point, let's, uh, let's uh, go on to uh, chapter chapter three, or go back to chapter three. So we're going to go back to uh, chapter three, numerical sequences and series. Okay. And so <coughs> you know, the reason we went on to continuity is because the continuity results use a lot of the compactness stuff. So I wanted to go from chapter two to chapter five so that you can see the link you know, immediately. Now we're gonna go back to numerical sequences and series. And what we're gonna do after this is sequences and series of functions. Okay, so we'll jump from three to seven afterwards. Okay, um, and that seven is sort of the climax of the course uh, where we'll see a, uh, we'll be dealing with sequences and series of functions but we're going to be also dealing with the notion of compactness. Okay, so it'll be there's going to this the great result of Ascoli Arzela, which shows that um, <coughs> that there's some sort of limit compactness result for functions. That is, if you have a sequence of functions, you're going to have some sort of convergent uh, convergent subsequence of those functions. Okay. Anyway, um, so this this will uh, this sort of smooths out the, the the narrative a little bit. But okay. Okay, so um, so here my here in my notes I, I have this comment: lots of definitions. So, so we're gonna have a lot of definitions, I guess. Uh, it doesn't seem like it. In comparison with what we did earlier, no. Okay. So um, okay, so here's a definition that you may have seen before. Um, you have some function going from the natural numbers into x, um, whereas so this is a in other words, you have a sequence, a sequence in a metric space x. Okay, right. So to every every natural number, you associate some point. Right. Every natural number, you know, every natural number n gets associated with some 
some point p, p of n, and we usually don't write p of n, we write p sub n, right? When you're talking about sequences, you don't use the function notation, you use the sequence notation, p sub n, right? Okay, so um, if there exists a point p uh, in x with the property that with the property that um, for all uh, epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n in n such that uh, the distance from pn to p is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to n. Then we say p sub n converges to p and x. Other, other common notation, p sub n converges to p. The limit of p sub n as n goes to infinity is p. Right? These all mean this, these are all just, it's the same thing. Okay, there's, there's, a short, there's a shorthand for this. Okay. If such a p, such a p doesn't exist, We say that um, uh, P sub n diverges. Diverges. Okay. Okay, so the picture is like this, right? You've got this timer thing here, right? You've got n here, right? One, two, three, four, five. You've got your metric space x, right? You've got some point p uh, in x. And what we're saying is that given any epsilon neighborhood, right? Given any epsilon neighborhood, given any, given any epsilon neighborhood of p, there exists a time such that if you're past that time, then p sub n lies in the epsilon neighborhood. Right. Okay, so you've got this, this timer, and you set this, somebody sets you a neighborhood and says, is that, is that, is that really the limit? If, you, if that's the limit, then no matter what epsilon I choose, you should be able to get close to it. And so they said they set you an epsilon, <coughs> and you you find a you find a time past which everybody lies inside there. Okay, everybody lies inside there. You say, look, I satisfied it, and they they give you another epsilon, and you find another time above which everybody lies inside the neighborhood, and you you can do that, no matter what what epsilon they give you, no matter what tolerance they give you, there's a time past which that tolerance is satisfied. Okay. If you can do it for every, if you can do it for no matter what tolerance, then <coughs> the person concedes that the limit is actually p. Yes, slightly. Would it also hold for um, like the situation if the inequality was the other way around? Like this? Yeah. No, no, no. That would, so what that would say, that would say that there exists an n, there exists an n such that um, before that time, everybody lies inside here, right? So that would tell you about behavior at the beginning, <coughs> beginning of your sequence. But you're interest, we're interested in what happens as n goes to infinity, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that would, that would just tell you uh, basically what happened at the very, very beginning of your sequence. OK. So the picture you want to keep in mind, um, picture you want to keep in mind is you know, like 1 over n. Right, so you've got your sequence uh, uh, p sub n equals one over n, right? Right, and so here's your sequence: one, two, three, four, five, plus more. Right, so your sequence one, two. Here's your n, right? One, a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. 
six, seven, et cetera, et cetera, right? And right, the, the piece of ends are going to converge to zero. Right? So, I've, so I've written it in graph form, but you know, again, sometimes it's better to visualize things <coughs> as maps. Right? So piece of n, right? zero, one, two, three, one, blah. Right? So I'm oh, sorry, there's one, there's zero. Right? Here's what P, P, P1, P2, P3, right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And if somebody gives you, you know, so if somebody gives you an epsilon of a half and it says, I'd like you to stay within a half of zero, well, what time do you choose? Whatever. You can choose, <laughs> you can't choose one. <laughs> don't choose time one, please. <laughs> but. And you don't want to choose two either because you want to be inside the, 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 the it's an open neighborhood, so you don't want to choose two either, right? But three onwards is fine, right? So, oh, look, past time three, I satisfy, satisfy this condition, right? You know, I could, I could take my n, right? So for epsilon equal, if epsilon is two, my n to be, you know, uh, my n to be three is fine, right? Because I know that, you know, one third is smaller than a half, <laughs> right? One third and anything bigger than anything past that point is going to be smaller than a third. It's going to be smaller than a half, right? And you see that no matter what epsilon I'm given, right? If I give you one over a million, if I take my epsilon to be one over a million, then what? What should my m be? What should time? What's my time? A million plus one, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So. You see that no matter what epsilon you're given, you can find a time that satisfies it. Right? The time, the, the n de depends on the epsilon. Right? As the epsilon changes, the n the n changes. Right? But you can find one, and then yes, yeah, Susan. So if we're talking about the neighborhood, does it mean that for some n there might be a piece of n that go below zero in this case, or it's just going to be the upper? Well, you see, this this one is, is all positive things, but really my neighborhood is like this. Right, so it might even go below. It could, yeah. Going below is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I make it like this. How about this? Um, negative 1 to the n, 1 over n. Okay. In that case, these guys are still going to work, right? Because if I look at the distance to 0, well, the distance to 0 is just 1 over n, right? So. You know, even though these guys are going to start flipping now, right? So now these guys are, you know, bouncing back and forth. Oops. Right? These guys are bouncing back and forth, right? But, you know, if you, if I give you a, a, a neighborhood, what am I saying? If I give you an epsilon of one half, why did I write a two there? Sorry, it should have been one half. But if I give you an, uh, an epsilon neighborhood of a half, well, three is still going to work, right? If I give you a, an epsilon of one over a billion, well, a billion plus one is still going to work. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah. So that's what you want to keep keep in your brain. Okay. Something something like that. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, <coughs> so some comment, <coughs> right? Um, the convergence. A piece of n depends on the metric space. Depends on the metric space x, right? In two senses, in that one, um, the the limit must lie in x, and two, the convergence. Depends on the metric, right? If you change, you know, you have to know what metric you're 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 talking about, right? Um, um, so if you look in the book, they 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 say, well, look, one over n doesn't converge in zero infinity, technically, right? Because Zero isn't in your space, right? Right. Zero. It should converge to zero, but zero isn't in your metric space, so we can't say that it converges. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, another thing is that if we change the metric, maybe this thing wouldn't converge at all in in the space. 
So you could have you could have the real numbers, uh, but put some different metric on it that one of the n doesn't converge to zero. Okay, okay. So um, some simple implications. Implications. So we've got p sub n, a sequence in the metric space x. <coughs> um, so there's a bunch of simple consequences. If p sub n converges, then uh, uh, for all radii, the neighborhood, whatever neighborhood, you, whatever neighborhood you choose of p, it contains almost all of the p sub n. Okay, so there, there are a bunch of others, but let's do the let's do the do, do them next time. So let's, let's just do this one first. Okay. So convergence is the same thing as saying that given any neighborhood, that neighborhood contains almost all of the, of the piece of that. When we say almost all, we mean all but uh, a finite number. Right. So that's a little bit different from the common use, the vernacular use of almost all. Uh, when mathematicians say almost all, they mean all but a finite number. Right. Almost all of us are, I don't know, what should I say? Geniuses. <laughs> right? uh, I don't know. <laughs> you, can, you, can say whatever, you can say whatever you want, because it's all but a finite number. Right? Almost all of us are green colored. Right? It's true. <laughs> OK. OK. Um, <coughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so let's let's do it, right? Um, so let's go to the forward direction. Let's say that P sub n converges to P, right? And we're saying that then n sub P contains almost all of the P sub n, right? So fix some, fix some, some radius, right? And you want to show that that neighborhood contains almost all of the piece of n, right? right? But you know that, right? Why? Turn to your neighbor and say why that's that's pretty clear. Turn to your neighbor why and say, oh well, look, the limit is p, so blah 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 blah. Okay, so remember, let's think, right, what does it mean for the limit to be P? It means that if you take any epsilon neighborhood, then there's a time past which everybody lies in the epsilon neighborhood, right? You got your epsilon neighborhood, you know that, say, well, we know there exists a time such that you know, if you're past that time, a uh, piece of n lies in the epsilon neighborhood. Right. Since the limit, right, since the since the limit is p, you know that this time past which everybody lies in the epsilon neighborhood. Well, then, who doesn't lie in the epsilon neighborhood? Just the guys before, right? So, 
only p1 through p n minus 1 could <coughs> not lie in that neighborhood. Okay. Only finitely many guys cannot, might not lie in it. Okay. Okay. Now suppose we've got the opposite. We want to prove the opposite thing. You say, okay, suppose we know that, say, given any neighborhood, only finitely many p sub n uh, lie outside. And we want to show that there exists, we want to show that, right, so we want to show that given any neighborhood, there exists a time past which all piece of n lie in the neighborhood. How do we find that? How do we find that that n? Any, uh, turn to your neighbor and talk for five seconds. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> okay. Here's your p. Here's your epsilon. Here's your epsilon, right? you know that all but finitely of the piece of n lie outside, right? So there's a bunch of guys that lie outside, but that's it, right? So what do we choose as our time past which everybody does lie inside the neighborhood? Well, we just choose a time big enough that we ignore, we miss all these guys, right? So just let, um, let n equal the greatest index. of those who lie outside. Plus one, let's say, just to be safe. <laughs> OK. We lie outside this thing, right? Then if you're bigger than that, then you, you can't be one of these guys, right? And so you must lie inside. So everybody past that end is going to lie inside. OK. Because right? you know there's finally many. This wouldn't work if there were infinitely many, right? Because you can't take the greatest index. Okay. okay, we'll do more of this stuff next time.